Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message. This really has been a uh, fun, fun week. And I know it's been exhausting at times as well um, with uh, every night and not wanting to miss a night. And Pastor Vince and I talked about putting a break night in there, but we... We decided not to because we wanted to have as close to the calendar as we could to the days of the events that Jesus, um, the things that he went through during Resurrection Week or Holy Week. And uh, we, we felt like even if there was somewhat sacrificial for someone, that it would just bring them back to the cross and to think about what, you know, Jesus went through and what just simply inconvenient for us was obviously uh, very difficult, but he endured to the very end. And I appreciate those that have been here enduring this week uh, through, uh, we're almost finished here and get back to somewhat of a regular uh, schedule, but it does, I pray, help us remember what Jesus went through. And as we had testimonies last night, a lot of people have learned quite a bit uh, through, this, um, through, this, uh, through this series. Yes. Praise the Lord. Tonight we are going to be looking at one of the only events that is, that is recorded that took place on the Sabbath itself as the sun went down and the, sa and the Sabbath began. Of course, Saturday... And as the Jews still honor the Sabbath, Friday evening, once the sun is down, uh, through the sun coming up on Sunday morning, which we, of course, are going to honor tomorrow when, the, when we find that Jesus Christ has been resurrected. And so we have, from the Jewish calendar, we have Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and therefore on the third day, which would be Sunday morning, Jesus Christ was resurrected. I was sharing with Pastor Vince last night that I do believe that many folks are understanding now from the Jewish calendar of what that, how the significance of that verse on the third day. Because most people think, well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's only two days. Hopefully we've explained that. But here today, we find that the special Sabbath is over, that Friday. We're going to find here that the day of preparation has expired, and so we have shifted into the Sabbath. And for those that were here last night, we remember studying uh, from Luke that the Sabbath was coming up, and the ladies had, had uh, and Joseph, and John tells us that Nicodemus was there as well. Very interesting from, uh, from John's Gospel. Uh, and so when we, when we find that they were shifting, they were on the clock, they had to have Jesus buried before uh, the, the Passover, I'm sorry, before the Sabbath began. And, you know, they had, you know, kind of, uh, they were on the clock. And so uh, here they've now gone to rest, they've gone to honor uh, the Sabbath as it was stated uh, in the books of the law. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 to 66 here tonight. I believe it's page 38 in your workbook if you're looking at that. And I will be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, Matthew 27, beginning with verse 62. Or the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he, Jesus, was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be. This 
five verses of Scripture is really important for us as believers, as this conversation was taking place, to, know, to, to be able to have the Word of God and let God use you so some conspiracy theory will not uh, convince you that Jesus Christ perhaps did not die, was not buried in the tomb, or someone snuck him out, he never really died, and all those kinds of things. This week we found where Pilate was convinced, according to John, by the centurion, that Jesus had in fact died, as Pastor Vince talked about Friday night, with blood and water coming out of his side, that he was a dead man. We learned last night that Joseph took uh, Jesus, the dead Jesus, if you will, off of the cross and put him in clean linen and laid him in the tomb, rich man's tomb, that no one had ever laid before. Jesus Christ was clearly dead. However, uh, there was there is this possibility, of, at least from the perspective of the priests and Pharisees, that someone may come and try to steal Jesus. In my opinion, if that would have been the case, the best time to try to come and steal Jesus would have been before Joseph got there, when everyone had left, and it was just a few people at the, at the cross. Uh, however, here we're going to break these verses down, so that you can have all the pieces coming together, so if someone comes to you and says, how do we know he actually died? How do we know he was actually buried? How do we know someone didn't sneak in there and, uh, and, and switch bodies, if you will. Remember, as a believer, if Jesus did not die, our faith is in serious trouble. God's word is in serious trouble. We've got a big problem if Jesus doesn't die. Okay, so on verse number 62 of Matthew 27, on the next day, okay, and of course, Friday is the special Sabbath. Friday is the day of preparation. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, which would be Saturday, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. So the same folks that put the plot together back in the middle of the week on Wednesday are now uh, coming to Pilate. These same folks who plotted to have the Lord killed, you know, come to Pilate, and they want to make sure that their plot is carried out without any flaws, they, don't want, they're, they're, they do not want any problem, even though the people they're worried about the most, Judas by now, of course, has hung himself, you know, or killed himself. And so by now we realize, you know, that the other 11 disciples, maybe they're going to be mad, maybe they are faithful to Jesus, and so they're going to be concerned. How many people here have studied politics before in college? What is what, what usually gets... The presidential candidate or the politician is not the act that he or she did that got them into trouble. What usually gets them is the cover-up. It got Nixon, it got Clinton, it got John, uh, Andrew Johnson when he was impeached but not convicted of it back in uh, 1868, uh, I think it was. Uh, the cover-up. The cover-up is what also gets a lot of pastors. You know, when they, uh, when they uh, make uh, mistakes with with relationships or gambling or any of those other problems, it's the cover-up. And then it, it got uh, Tammy, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, if you remember that cover-up. You know, the cover-up gets, uh, gets folks. Well, here, is, here are those same plotters coming to Pilate. Now, remember, Jesus, we have to look at the time clock. Jesus has been buried. The stone has been put in front of the tomb. Jesus has been laid in fine linen, clean linen, by Joseph, that prophecy had been, has been fulfilled, and then the chief priests gathered. Interesting, remember guys, this week, Jesus and his Father, therefore God himself, has been a step ahead the entire time. Okay, and so here they come on the scene, and they go to Pilate, okay, and they've gathered together to Pilate. Now, if you've ever been in a position of leadership, and you see 10, 7 people, 10 people, 15 people coming to you, and they all have on their game face, you're sitting there thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> As a teacher, when I see a group of parents coming, or a group of students coming, what did I do? As a pastor, if you can see that determination in one's eye, uh-oh. 
If you, you know, if you, when I worked at a seafood restaurant in Maryland, I was the uh, assistant manager there, very young, but when people started coming, especially the cooks were the ones I feared the most because we were running out of money, and they would come to me and say, Justin, we don't have any fries. We don't have any fish. This is a seafood restaurant. What am I going to do? We, you know, and it's like, oh boy, they're all aiming, especially as soon as you pull in the parking lot, and there they are ready to meet you, you know something's going on, you know? And here's, here's Pilate as he is greeted by the chief priests and Pharisees as they are gathered together. What do they say? Verse 63, saying, sir, now this is interesting, in our, in our lingo, of course, in the English lingo, sir, they give this man respect. They're already wanting to, uh, you can almost see a sarcastic sir here, you know that their plot is going to be carried out without any hiccup. They're not going to be revealed as, you know, part of the reason that Jesus was betrayed. Saying, sir, we remember. Now this is great. This is really good. Because they understood and remembered <laughs> even before Jesus was resurrected. And the disciples didn't. Disciples didn't. Now this is very interesting to me. This is very interesting to me as I was thinking about this tonight. And of course, Matthew was one of the 12 disciples, which is why, you know, it's just an awesome book, uh, Matthew and John, because they were, they were two of the 12. But these guys remembered. So therefore, what does that tell you? All the times that Jesus predicted his death and resurrection, all the times when he gave the woes, as we, as we talked about Monday night and a little bit Tuesday night, those folks understood what Jesus was saying. And I believe very much they believed what Jesus was saying. That's right. Therefore, if they did not, they would not be going to Pilate. Why? Because right now we are at Saturday. We're on the second day. And I do believe that when it came to who Jesus was, these Pharisees, these scribes, now these are the folks that, that consented to the deed that was done to Jesus. This is not Joseph. This is not Nicodemus. These are the folks that were part of the plotters to have Jesus killed, okay, and to be crucified. And while he was still alive, you know, this is amazing. While he was still alive, how the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. So they call Pilate, sir. They call Jesus the deceiver, that he will rise. That tells me that there was a part of them that was scared to death. He was getting out of that grave. Right. They believed even before the resurrection. You know what I often believe as I was thinking about this this week and preparing? Mm -hmm. Is that when I'm preaching and teaching and talking with unbelievers, even though they may say they don't believe, I do believe something's getting in. Yeah. Right. I do believe God's word is penetrating the depth of their heart. Simply because the gospel is easy, easy enough for a child to understand. And as, I, and as I look at this, I'm thinking to myself, you know, they, they're doing all they can to convince themselves that Jesus is going to stay in that tomb. He was the deceiver. Lord, we re, uh, sir, we remember what he said, that after, the, after three days he was going to rise, you know, but I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was a large part of them that knew Jesus was getting out of the grave. Right. When your cover-up is about to get found out, what do people do? They get desperate. They panic. You know, they begin to think, what if he was right? What if? My prayer is, is that as we see signs of the times unfold, and the people that aren't buying into the fact that we're in the last days, even many Christians who aren't buying into that, as we see events unfold, that they're going to say the question, what if? Because I believe God's word is penetrating. And you can only tell yourself no so many times. Especially, like in this case, two days is down, we got one day to go. You're, they're on the clock now. On Friday, Joseph and Mary and Mary, you know, they were on the clock. Because the, but because the special Passover or special Sabbath was about to expire. Now these guys are on the clock because it's almost the third day and it's time for Jesus, you know, to rise. We really don't have time to be resting. These guys should have been resting. They could not. They had to 
sees that people say, well, why wasn't Pilate resting? Because Pilate wasn't a Jew. Pilate was a Roman, representing the Roman government. And so here it's, here it's significant for us to understand that after three days I will rise as they quote the Lord. Amazing. They had an understanding even more so than the disciples. Verse 64, therefore, Command the tomb to be made secure until the, until the third day. Now here it's interesting. They call him sir. The cover-up's in action. They're on the time clock. And they're telling Pilate what to do. This is what somebody will do when they're cover-up or they're concerned or they're worried and they're getting desperate. They're going to start giving orders that rightfully do not belong right, to them. Right. And here is Pilate, as he has shortly before told Joseph to bury Jesus. He's now in the tomb. Jesus has already declared that the tomb is going to be empty, meaning he would get to the tomb. He has gotten to the tomb. It's now Saturday, and within 24 hours on our clock, Jesus is about to get up out of the grave. That tomb is going to be empty. And so they command, they declare the command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. So what they say is command the tomb be secure for the third day. Pilate, just do it until Sunday is over. Until Sunday's over, just keep guarding. After that, we have nothing to worry about. They knew how specific Jesus would be. That he would be right on time. If he is real, and there's a part of them that think that he is, because if they don't, they're not there. There is a part of these guys who believe Jesus is getting out of the grave. And again, it's the Sabbath. They're violating their own law. They're talking to a Roman. They're giving commands. They believe this, and they want Jesus secured. Let me tell you something, guys. In America today, we're actually doing the same thing. We're trying to pacify Jesus. We're trying to put a pacifier in his mouth. Like some parents do with their kids, they put a plug in their mouth to try to keep them quiet. We're trying to do the same thing for Jesus today. But guess what? There's no politician in America that can keep Jesus Christ quiet. He's going to be heard. Here, these guys, these religious leaders, with, the, the, with Pilate and his help, they're believing. They're going to keep it secure. Now, see, here's where you see some transition happening. Now, they're going to play the card... Which is, which is just simply human logic, the disciples are going to come in and steal it. Well, that's not what they said first. They said first, the deceiver said, he was going to rise on the third day. That seems bizarre. That seems like something Peter Pan, you were watching Peter Pan. That seems like something Hollywood would make up. Which is why the Pharisees and the priests, chief priests have to digress and look at the disciples. One of the, you know, look at the disciples to make up some excuse, but will you secure it, Pilate? Will you put a Roman guard around them? Will you let us secure it? It needs to be secure. Least his disciples come by night and steal him away. Okay. How bizarre is that? You know, steal a dead man's body, which I'm sure they're thinking... And with human logic, that, that can start a conspiracy world rolling, kind of like, you know, some people believe that Elvis is still alive. What a, what a year for deaths in 2016. Prince is now dead. Uh, China, the wrestler, she died. People dying left and right. Very young. Very young folks that are dying. And many people think, well, it's just a conspiracy. Like I said, people like Elvis is still alive. Well, Jesus was convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt. He convinced everybody when he bled out of his side. Pilate was convinced. This man was dead. He was buried. But if there can be some type of conspiracy that the disciples come in there, you know, and maybe the, the plot that the Pharisees and chief priests and elders and scribes put together to kill Jesus would come out. We can't have that happening. So we got to give some type of loophole for there to be, you know, an out for us in case things don't go too well. But basically what they're saying, in case Jesus does get out of the grave, we need to be able to say something. 
which is what? The disciples took it. Which is why tomorrow is so important. Because it wasn't the disciples that came. The disciples didn't even come to pay their respects to Jesus. It was the same two Marys that helped bury him. They had to go tell Peter and John. And they ran back. Thomas, he needed to see the holes in the wrists, which we'll talk about in the coming days. It wasn't the disciples. They had nothing to worry about. But this is just that human logical piece. Therefore, again, verse 64, Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. Steal him away, the tomb's empty, and just kind of make something up. Church, let me just say this to you. God doesn't need a human help when it comes to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Which is why Paul would later say in Philippians 3.10 that I may know the power of his resurrection. And the Father would bring him out of the grave. And Jesus defined himself, I am the resurrection and the life. But this is the conspiracy piece. This is the conspiracy piece. So let's protect, let's protect Jesus. Let's protect his dead body from disciples coming in to steal him away and then telling everybody through some fairy tale that he's alive. Very interesting. Very interesting. And to say to the people, now who are, the, who are these people? The multitudes. The multitudes who who some were still very very much in an attitude of grief, those that were legitimate followers, others that were sad that this was the Messiah, he would certainly take himself off the cross. He would call for his father to send 12 legions of angels. Some that were disappointed, some that changed their words from uh, Hosanna, Hosanna, to crucify, crucify. But to talk to these people and to say that he is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Who are they talking about here? The last deception. Is that the deception that the Pharisees were trying to pull on Pilate and the people? Was that the deception by calling Jesus the deceiver? That this whole thing is just some illusion? I would like to believe here, church, that when the when he, this last part of verse 64 says so the last deception will be worse uh, than the first, it's simply they don't want Jesus to get up out of that grave, and they don't want at all, they, don't, they have to come up with something that's going to give a check and balance from their life. And if there is a scapegoat, it's going to be the disciples. So put a guard around it. Put a guard around it. Verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. So he takes the, he takes the ownership of the, of the Pharisees and the, and the chief priests. You have your own guard, put your own guard around it. Make it secure as you know how. Basically, Pilate, when he said he washed his hands of it, he gave, he gave permission without much argument to Joseph to bury Jesus. And now he is, he is saying to the Pharisees and the chief uh, priests, you have your own guard, make it as secure as you know how. Put as many around them as you would want. Around the tomb. Whether it be through, through Sunday or through Monday or however long you want to be there. You have my permission to do it. So what do they do? Verse 66. So they went and made the tomb secure. They got what they wanted. They pushed a little bit. Pilate didn't push back. They got what they wanted. Put, the, put, the, uh, put, as, put as many uh, people around the tomb as you want. Is that really going to stop Jesus? Is that really going to stop the Father? From being glorified by Jesus Christ being resurrected. Church, when I think about this, I think about what uh, our government and what politicians and what the political correctness is trying to do 
by shutting up the church and shutting up Jesus Christ. It's not going to work. Amen. I'm excited for these last days. That's right. I'm excited to understand the signs of the times. God is bigger than anything that's coming out of Washington, D.C. That's right. God is bigger than anything coming out of Augusta. God is bigger than anything coming out of Atlanta, Georgia, when they changed because of the pressure of the NFL to pull the Super Bowl from Atlanta. God is bigger than anything that North Carolina is trying to do in vetoing the governor's bill there. God is bigger than anything that we can imagine. We cannot, we, no person, no government, no individual can stop the power of God. Right. <laughs> Nero, he tried, didn't he? Burned Christians at the stake. Used them as, as street lights, basically, in his garden. Persecution always spreads the gospel. Right. It doesn't stop it. I ask you tonight, do you believe and are you ready for to stand up and know the power of God and to stand up and to know that even when there is a conspiracy and there are people who are naysayers or people who are actually the deceivers themselves working on behalf of the adversary who think they can stop Jesus Christ? The Beatles, John Lennon wrote a song or made a, made a statement. We're more popular than Jesus Christ. Some of you remember that from the 60s. Shortly after, he wrote the song, Let It Be. There are folks who think that Jesus is dead and no longer present, just like here. But I think deep down, they actually believe. I think deep down, they do believe that he is the Messiah and refuse to humble themselves and bow before the Lord. You can only convince yourself a lie is truth only for so long. Here, these disciples, I'm sorry, these Pharisees and these chief priests, they were, they were attempting to deceive themselves. They were attempting to uh, keep Jesus in a tomb any way that they could. But the thing they forgot is the supernatural healing and sovereignty of the Almighty God. The same God who took a trip into a fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember that? To Nebuchadnezzar's dismay. It's the same God who, as the, as the Hebrews came to the Red Sea, who parted it. It's the same God who Calls the sun to stand still. It's the same God who moved mountains. It's the same God who just in this same very week where Jesus Christ healed the lame and gave sight to the blind. A week before that, Lazarus got out of the grave at the command of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus' Father be glorified. It is the same God who's about in just 12 hours going to get Jesus, his son, out of the grave by sending forth angels to roll away the tomb. To bring forth all this guard, all these guards to fall asleep and miss the power of God. Church, I humbly believe that if we step out and believe God is still a supernatural God, we'll have a revival here. Amen. I believe it. I believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I believe we're going to see naysayers. Those just like these Pharisees and chief priests who deep down actually do know. Do actually do know. And there's a part of them that believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that God's going to raise up. I really do. I'm praying that God will give me an opportunity to speak to politicians and naysayers who think that Jesus Christ... I mean, think about it. Donald Trump came out and said that the evangelical vote is not that significant anymore. I don't believe that. I believe that if, if we know that God is a supernatural, amazing God, America can, and the church can certainly be revived. 
I understand we're in the last days. I understand Jesus Christ is coming. I understand Israel will stand alone, but I still know the word of God. And the believers rise up and step out and believe that, that anything is possible with God and that he still is the truth, the way, and the life. Many lives can be changed and souls can be saved. Amen. Verse 66, so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now, if you remember from last night, Joseph rolled the stone in front. It is the Pharisees and chief priests that seal it. Now, the Roman guard, most historians believe, would have probably just four people around it, around the tomb. But here we see where the Pharisees and the chief priests, the Jews, themselves are going to put a guard. They're going to put it, they're going to make it secure, they're going to seal the stone, and they're going to set the guard. And from the, from the sources I looked up, that could be as many as 15 to 20 Jewish people around the tomb. And if you put the four that most likely Rome had there, which was customary, you're talking about maybe as many as 25 people around the tomb. That is sealed. So you, here you have Jesus. He's been dead for two days. Jo Joseph has buried him in clean linen. There is a stone in front of it. The stone is now sealed. And you have several men around the tomb, around the clock. And all they're doing is trying to get to Monday morning. Now who's on the clock? God the Father. <laughs> It's God who has the ball in his court now. What's he going to do? Is he going to hand off? Is he going to take a knee? Football terms. Or is he going to say, you know what? We're throwing to the end zone. Something amazing is going to happen in 12 hours. Something amazing is going to, is going to happen. And in and, and the world, because Rome is the world, so with Pilate, with the Jews, with the religious people, all on the same page. What is that? To, to keep Jesus in that tomb. And they're going to lose. That to, me is, that to me is amazing. That to me is awesome stuff. Here is the, the, the thing that the chief priests and Pharisees feared the most. Is what the deceiver said on the third day I will rise. And once the ball was in the Father's court, that's exactly what was going to happen. So I just want to take a, a, just a quick detour here. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was conquering hell. <coughs> King David prophesied. That's what he would do. Luke refers in Acts chapter 2 that the Messiah at this point would go to Hades or go to hell and conquer it. Jesus was taking care of business there to where the adversary was going down. Why? People say often, why were these guys working so hard? Because the adversary was in trouble. He could only do, he could only do so much when it came to the power of God. If you remember, what did, what did God tell Satan regarding Job? Who remembers from Job 1? Uh, he said you can do anything you want, but you don't touch his life. All right. Mm -hmm. Life belongs to God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, first he said don't touch him. And so here is significant. Here is the adversary knew what was happening in hell as Jesus was conquering it, and that prophecy was being fulfilled. He had his... He had his minions, if you will, and the world who were, who were plotting this death of Jesus that we had talked about back in the middle of the week. They, he had them doing all they could, and it still could not keep Jesus in the grave. Look at today. Wolves in sheep's clothing, they're doing all they can. The world is doing all they can. Jesus isn't welcome in some churches. You gotta just see what I just got this uh, from missionary Chris Trueworthy, and it broke my heart. Rick Warren's new book. 
how Muslims and Christians can get along. The Purpose Driven Mosque. The title of the book. Mosque. 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 And in the and in the in the preface. It says, praise God, in Arabic. And some of these titles, subtitles of the different chapters is just blowing me away. If you want that, I can send that link to you. Chris Trueworthy sent it to me, thought I'd be fascinated with it. I was. I believe it's hitting, I believe it's hitting bookstores Tuesday. What is he but saying? It's to get along. It's, 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 it's Christalom, is what he calls it. Christianity and Islam together. But is he saying we worship the same God? Uh, it's a lot. You can draw that connection. Yes. However, when we see these events, even from religious circles, what did Jesus say in Luke? It was in the movie. A re I know it was, the movie was from Matthew, but there was a reference that actually came from Luke as well. Well, what did Jesus say? Basically what he said that last week of his life as he was teaching on Monday and Tuesday, he said, watch those who wear the religious robes. Wow. Here are the Pharisees, of course, but as we look at that prophetically speaking for the signs of the times, because that's when he was addressing the signs of the times, we must watch those folks because the adversary has some of those people being uh, used for, his, for his, uh, his, his pleasure. And however... I don't want folks to leave here discouraged tonight. We serve the resurrection and the life. We win. These things from popular writers, popular preachers, I mean, all this stuff that's, that's out here today, I mean, praise God. I mean, the, the stuff that Franklin Graham's doing just blows me away. But the opposition that he's getting is just, it's, it's mind-boggling. He's real. And the opposition, he's coming to Augusta. We're going to go over there, by the way, in August. I mean, he is real, but the opposition he's getting from these folks. I mean, this guy, this guy is, is, is just laying it all out. God bless this man. Amen. Because to me, I mean, his father was, the, was America's pastor of the 20th century. But the things that he's saying and doing, praise God for him. Front line, a modern day Daniel, a modern day Isaiah, not afraid. Unlike his father didn't want to touch the political agenda, frankly, Graham's was touching the political agenda, praise the Lord. But there are few and far between that are like that. But that's how it was here, is this garden, is this garden being set up. However, you can't stop the power of the Almighty God. You cannot stop what he can do and will do. And, the, and, the, and you stand on the word, and you stand on the prophecy of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, why is that significant? Because now, as we prepare for the rapture and his second coming, we have to shift our focus so we don't make the same mistake that the religious folks here made and that the uh, so-called followers of Jesus Christ made. We have to look at it and say, okay, Lord, we're not going to make the same mistake. We are going to watch, we are going to wait, and we are going to pray until you return. Because if we don't do that, we're going to make the same mistake that these guys were making. We're going to make the same mistake that the disciples were making. To where they did not understand until he was resurrected. And women had to go get them. They did not understand. How, what will it be for some Christians? Well, once the rapture happens, that's what my older brother thinks. You know, that's what you know, some people think. We must believe now. If Jesus was so specific, leading up to his, his, his death and resurrection, and basically the last week of his life, he was given the signs of the times, and to be ready for his second coming, which is referring to us. Matter of fact, John 17, he prayed for future believers. I mean, this stuff is so amazing. And may we take hold and know that once the Father's plan is being carried out, there's nothing that can stop it, which means the father could say, son, go get my children tonight, and you can't stop it, I can't stop it. We just have to be ready. Mm -hmm. I know I want to be ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I want to be looking up for my redemption drawing nigh. I don't want to, to even th tell myself or deceive myself by, Lord, I'd love to visit this place and I'd love to do that place. I believe, Father, if you come today, if you send your son today, I want to be faithful so that my master will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Tomorrow when we come in here, we're going to shift to the resurrection piece in which everybody that's here tonight is very familiar with. And we're going to see that once the Sabbath was over and the sun came up on Sunday, which is why most Christians, with the exception of the Seventh-day Adventists and a few other groups, worship on Sunday, or what John called the Lord's Day, is because Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday after the Sabbath was over. We're going to come in here and we're going to say, Jesus was right. The religious people were wrong. What the Pharisees and chief priests were afraid of, as they remembered before he was resurrected, came true. And they knew it would. At least a part of them did. Say, Pastor, how do you know that? I just want to tell you one more time. They wouldn't be dealing with Pilate. They wouldn't be sealing the tomb. They wouldn't be putting all these men around the tomb. They remembered. Well, no one else did. You would think that the disciples, if they had remembered, they would have ran there Sunday morning and said, Lord, here you are. Jesus, the Father wouldn't need to send angels, would he? Nobody came. Other than the ladies coming for burial ceremonial purposes because the Passover was now over and they could come out and perform those ceremonies again. In the movies, you see Mary and Mary all dressed in black in their mourning and all. They weren't coming... So they weren't coming with excitement to see Jesus Christ, the resurrection, and the life. But the power of God, church, we, there is nothing that can shut up the power of God. Amen. Nothing. When it comes to His plan that has been preordained, and it is before us now, the signs of the time. As things are being carried out just as they were in Jesus' last week of his life. They're being carried out again. Jesus has spent this past week warning us of those things. He showed his love for us on the cross. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt he died. He was buried in the tomb. There was a guard set around him. The tomb was sealed. God said, no problem for me. That's no problem. My son's getting up out of the grave. Now we see all these, we're getting, you know, I was talking to my father yesterday, and he, you know, he'd love to go back to the 1950s. The dead, don't get flustered. Let not your heart be troubled. This is not too much for God. Amen. I know, Just, I know, but this just, I've got grandkids in these schools, and you're up there, and mm -hmm. things don't always go well, and, you know, people are just awful sometimes, you know, and it's a bad not your heart be trouble. Nothing can stop the power of God. Amen. No way can the, the will of God be stopped. Which is why Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father interceding. And he's simply waiting for those words. Son, go again. My children. And as soon as that happens, the angels know what to do. The eastern sky is going to part. And just like tomorrow morning when we come in here, the angels knew what to do. They came down to the tomb. Rolled it away. Declared to the ladies, you cannot find the living amongst the dead. He's no longer here. He has risen. Go tell Peter. Go tell John. Go tell the others. The Lord is alive. Amen. Wow. Amen. That's amazing. Exciting. People think pastor Christians are losing their edge. 
No, I think it's just God full of a Gideon and his army, in my opinion. God is looking for the faithful who will endure till the end. God laid that on my heart earlier today. Hannah and I were, were uh, praying. God laid that on my heart. You guys know the story of Gideon, don't you, from the book of Judges? Gideon said, my arm is way too small. God said, yeah, I'm going to make it a little smaller. <laughs> but, go tell them to go drink down at the river and put their, whoever puts their, whoever dips with their hand and those who put their mouth, you know, right in the water and eat like a dog or a deer or something. You know, God just weeded down, didn't he? Weeded down, weeded down, weeded down. And then God did the supernatural. Blow your horn. They blew their horn. The Midianites, they got all confused. They started killing each other. And God got the victory. God's going to get the victory here too. He gets out of the grave of his son tomorrow morning. And in these last days, God's going to get the victory. God's looking for faithful. Jesus turned the world upside down with 12. And in these last days... I think we're going to see God separate wheat from tares. He's going to raise up those that are faithful to him, which is why Jesus would say, those that endure shall be saved. Say, Pastor, why is all this happening? Why? Jesus told us it would. He told us to worry about false teachers. He told us to worry about, you know, false prophets, the spirit of the Antichrist. He gave us all this instruction. We should not be surprised by reading the Purpose Driven Mosque. That should not surprise us. But that's out there. Chrysalum should not surprise us. It's now on, on a FAFSA. I mean, uh, this was only Article 2. Part of FAFSA that students, when they, get, when they leave high school and they fill out FAFSA for it to go to college, and you have to choose your religion, or you can just put, no, you know, do not want to, or whatever. It's an optional question. But one of the choices is Chrysalum. Since when? Since, I don't know, two or three years ago? Really? You got the coexist movement that's so popular now. Religion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this stuff is real, but it shouldn't surprise us. Why? Jesus said, this stuff must happen for me to return. Yeah. I wonder if he's Will we walk to... forward? Yeah. Will we walk straight ahead? <laughs> Will we be faithful? Believing in the knowing that even when things look the bleak, it's just like it was with this as the guard was set around the tomb. The tomb is sealed. He's, in, he's, he's dead. He's in the clean linen. There are a lot of people around the tomb. It's secured completely. The disciples aren't moving around anywhere. They think their master's dead. They're grieving. They're, you know, it's not a lot happening. But then who shows up? The Father. And the power of his resurrection. So tonight I encourage you to be encouraged. How about that? <laughs> I encourage you to let not your heart be troubled. I think it's going to be through this that we will find who truly has made Jesus your chief cornerstone. Amen. Who will truly say, I'm, I, I'm standing on the word. And Jesus spent the last week of his life filling us and teaching us with truth. Even when the deceivers, the workers of the adversary, the sons of the devil, as Jesus called them, were putting their plot out. They were trying to prevent against the cover up and they were doing all they could to keep Jesus in the tomb. Guess what? In 12 hours, he's alive. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Do you believe? Have you made him your chief cornerstone? And are you ready to face persecution? In America, it's here, guys. It is here. It is upon us. It is upon us quickly. But guess what? We know the power of the Almighty God we win. God will take care of the faithful. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. Lord, it's a very... Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. 
We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel in the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.